My name is John Pasfield, and the title of this reading will be Ostfringe Video 8, The Reflective Journal. This is my novel, Ostfringe, A Visit with Grandad. Uh, family picture there. My mom, the little girl in the corner. Her mom and dad seated. Her dad, a Royal Marine. Her brother's in the middle. Her grandfather and the grandfather's oldest daughter in the back row. So that's the novel. Uh, but in this video, I'm going to read from the journal which I wrote while planning and writing the novel. The title of the journal is The Making of Ospringe, and it can be found and accessed for free on my website, John Passfield, all one word, small letters, dot ca. The novel is 54,000 words, and the journal is 97,000 words, about twice as long as the novel. It records seven months of reflection on the developing novel from October 2011, that's the year uh, my mom would have been 100 years old, to April 2012. In this reading, I'm going to present five passages as a sample of what the Ospreys Journal contains. I'm taking all five passages from the last note of the almost 100,000 word journal. So I wrote an awful lot about my family and about how I turned my family into a novel. The final Henry Kennett note for this journal. Now, Henry Kennett is the grandfather of the two children in the novel. Note 19 is a very long one, almost twice the word length that I've been allocating for each of these journal notes. I felt that there was much that I wanted to explore in that culminating chapter of the Henry Kennett, the grandfather, major cycle. So I just kept speculating as to the ways in which that major cycle adds to the novel. Nevertheless, the emphasis that I've placed on one character raises the question as to whether this is a novel which is more about Henry Kennett, the grandfather, than about the other two main characters, the two children, my mom and her brother. There's no doubt that I saw the Henry Kennett character and Henry Kennett Major Cycle as the most challenging elements of the novel to plan and to write, but I still feel that the novel is well balanced among the three main characters, grandfather and two children, and that I was right to see the Gertrude character, my mom, as the outer frame character, the one who provides a frame by which the whole novel can be seen as a single unit. So that's the first passage. Here's the second passage in the Ospringe journal that I've selected. This journal is approaching 100,000 words. I always have the feeling as I work on a journal that I'm just beginning to explore the implications of the various aspects of the novel which I'm discussing at a satisfactory no level when it's time to stop. However, it's best to draw this journal to a close, to move on to other things, and to leave the continuation of discussion of the art of the novel for future planning notebooks and 30 journals. So I did that, and uh, there are now over 30 notebooks and 30 journals, all discussing the art of novel writing. Here's the third uh, passage that I chose from the Osmond Journal. I've left an open question as to whether the character of the father, Walter Davies, has shared his London origins with his wife. When I interviewed her, my mother said of her father, Walter Davies. So these are real people I'm turning into characters. This is uh, my family collection of information about my family, Oak Street, the Passfield family. Here's an interview which I did with my mother on tape, orally, and then typed. So it's printed in that book. Here's my mother talking about her childhood. Well, I just know what my father told me, and he said that he was born in London, and his mother came from Scotland, and her name was Hannah Peatling. His father's parents came from Wales, and I think near Cardiff, but he was born in London, of course. He was one of the younger ones. They were quite a large family, and his mother died when one of the babies was born. He was about two, and his brother William was about four. And then there were others, older, but I don't really know much about them. And for a few years, oh, the sister's name was Hannah, uh, his older sister, and she tried to look after the family for a few years, and then the father died, 
and they were still quite young. And so the two youngest were put in the Dr. Bernardo's home. And I, I suppose they lived there for a few years. And then they're about 12 or something like that. They were sent out to Canada to some farmers. So that's the end of my mom's passage. Here's me again writing. We all know people differently and at different levels of their being. It's possible that the character Walter Davies, my mom's father, can tell his wife something that he wouldn't tell his children to be hobbled with, wouldn't want his children to be hobbled with. He is a father and he would be telling his own children a story about a father who gives his children up to a charity home. To tell this story might well be painful to the children and might be painful to their father. Now this happened in the 19th century, it's still happening today. People give their children up to a school or an institution or just send them to another country. People are putting their kids on buses in South America and sending them to the United States, hoping they'll have a better life. Sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't. It cuts across all races and it cuts across all times. This happened in 1895. It's happening today in the world. I asked myself whether the fictional Walter Davies, my mom's father, my grandfather, has told his wife about this secret and couldn't answer the question, so I left it unanswered in the novel. At any rate, the origins of the idea of the discrepancy between the father's actual story and the one that he has told is thematic in terms of novel interact with other image patterns in the novel very tellingly. So very simply, my mom thought her father was an orphan, that his father, his mother had died in childbirth, she knew. She thought her father's father had died, and then an orphan, her father, had been put in the Bernard Holmes. Actually, her father, as I saw later, when I looked at the records, had taken four of his boys to the Bernardo Holmes and offered them, and they took three, and they kept one in England and sent two to Canada, one of whom was my mom's father, her grandfather. He was well treated. He then went back to England when he was 18. He came out here when he was 12 to Canada, went back when he was 18, joined the Royal Marines, served for 20 years, met a girl, had uh, uh, married her and had five children, and then brought them back to the very farm where it had been a Bernardo boy. So a very happy story. Often these stories were not happy, But the question then was, when I put Walter Davies, my mom's father, in a novel, do I have him tell the actual story or not? Was he ashamed of the fact that, it's very poignant, the records say that the boy asked for $10 here in Canada to send back to England to bury his father so his father won't be buried in a pauper's grave. This happened in my family. To people I knew, I knew my grandfather, never knew that story. Well, you know, when he was alive, he died when I was in my teens, and he was in his 80s. So what do you do when you put this information into a novel? That was my question. Here's the fourth passage from that journal. My mother's memory was very accurate. Arthur Percival of the Faversham Society remarked on the accuracy of her 60-year-old memories. In 1983, I taped her. 60 years after she left England, 1923-1983, and a fellow who lived in Faversham all his life, head of the Faversham Society, said that her memories were very accurate. So uh, her memories of her life in Ospringe and Faversham prior to leaving England when she was 11 years old in 1923. In addition, the Bernardo reports, which my mother never saw, bear out her claim that the sister looked after the Davies children until they were submitted to the Bernardo homes. This makes her mistake understood uh, mistaken understanding that her father died before the boys were put in a Bernardo home seemed like something that her father had told her rather than a slip of memory on her part. It's possible that Walter Davies, her father, was ashamed that his father was unable to keep the family together and had to give him up to the Bernardo homes. This is London poverty in the 1890s, you know, 40, 50 years earlier, Dickens was writing about it in Oliver Twist. Perhaps it was a shame at the father, perhaps it was shame at the circumstances and love for the father that caused my mom's father to keep the facts from his children if he did so deliberately. So I'm just speculating there as the family history. Here's the fifth uh, passage from the Osprey Journal. Two of the memories that my mother shared have remained very vivid for me. Two dashes here. Number one, the kittens who were born in the cell where the Davies children couldn't reach them, and two, the figs, 
which hung over the back fence for the, from the doctor's yard and which never ripened. Well, I saw both. I went to England in 2000, a year after my mom died, and the cell uh, was in uh, what uh, my mom and her brother called the fire hall, but it was a storage place for the fireman's equipment where her their grandfather lived. It had been a jail, had been turned over to the fireman. The key was lost, and the kittens were born inside the cell, and the kids couldn't get at them. That was her memory. The other, the figs, which hung over the uh, back fence for the doctor's yard, the fig tree was still there. And I stood there, and it had been 80 years since my mom left England, and there was the same fig tree still growing figs. And my mom had said you couldn't eat them, and a lady came along, and I told this story. And she said, oh, well, my husband eats those figs. They ripen now. So maybe uh, global warming was part of that 80 years later. Anyway, it's interesting. And I worked those images into the novel based on what my mom had told me. I have no idea whether these images had the same resonance for my mom as they've had for me. There are certainly memories that stayed with her for all her life. They work well as imagery in the novel. They're obviously images of things that are present but just out of reach. I feel that they take on a great resonance as they interact with the other images and image patterns of the rest of the novel. By this I mean that these images are exclusive in origin to a little girl, my mom, but that they interact with images and image patterns in the major cycles of the other two main characters, her grandpa and her brother. I'm quite confident that this novel is not made up of three separate stories, short stories, or three novellas, but that it is one thematic entity in which the imagery that is both shared and not shared is in the pre-conscious minds of the three main characters is operative in the image pattern, which is the whole novel as one thematic unit. So I'm interested in the imagery that we share with other people, but also the imagery that we do not share with other people. And the interaction of those two gives us our relationships, I'm sure. Okay, now, those are the five passages from the Osprey Journal. Here's a note that I wrote, connected but not directly connected. It's uh, more about novel writing, as I was reading over these passages. There's something that disturbs me when I read criticism of the modernist novels. These novels are often presented as depicting the stream of consciousness in the human mind. I don't mind that phrase, as I believe this not only applies to the modernist novels in general, but it also applies to the poetic novel forms as I have developed it. However, what irritates me about the commentaries that refer to the modernist novel as a stream of consciousness novel is that the commentators often say that what the modernist novels are capturing is the randomness of life. These novels depict the thinking process that goes on in the human mind in response to the living of the present life and remembering the past life. However, I believe that the modernist novel, certainly the poetic novel that I have developed, shows the human mind thinking both randomly and precisely. In fact, the premise of such a novel is that the struggle of the human mind is to think on topic, to problem solve, to see potential form in what seems like randomness. It is not the perception of randomness that the modern novelist novel is depicting by the use of the stream of consciousness technique. It is the struggle to see past the blindness of the perception of randomness to the patterns that speculative thinking suggests to the mind as a means of coping with seeming randomness. That randomness is an author-established element in the modernist novel as one of the most common critical misperceptions about that literary art form. Thank you for watching this video. The Osprey's Journal can be accessed for free on my website, johnpassfield.ca.